Hello again, it is me, Alex from Barefaced, and ye oldy prototype Barefaced guitar cap that I talked about a couple of videos ago. Now, I thought as I have tried to explain how ports work in my previous video, I could then get into how the next stage of the guitar cab prototyping happened. And <clears throat> the key to this is to understand that when I was talking about ports before, and yes, I was talking about like a sort of cylindrical tube like this in that context, the port doesn't have to be a cylindrical tube. It doesn't have to be a tube at all. It just has to be an air mass constrained in a space that is kind of the boundary between the internal air within the enclosure and the air outside it. I often say within the room, but you know, we mean the room or the world or wherever, whatever space we're in that the sound will be emanating to. So when I was, th this basically, this cab got to a certain point and then it needed quite a lot more time, thought, work, experimentation to see how to get the sort of voices we'd need to make it work for guitar. And the more time I spent thinking about it and investigating and umming and ahhing, the more I was learning that it was going to be very difficult to try and get, try and keep what's so brilliant about the guitar sounds that have happened over the last 70 years or so, and but solve the problems in terms of dispersion and, and things like that without losing too much of that guitar tone. And what I wanted to do was try and keep that sound, but solve the dispersion, solve the output, make it work better in the real world. And the other issue was that this design uses two speakers. So it's one speaker giving you your tone and the second speaker generating further output. And the problem with having two speakers is if you've got two tens, you can go smaller if you go to two eights, but is an eight inch guitar speaker gonna sound like a 10 inch guitar speaker? Does a 10 inch guitar speaker even sound like a 12 inch guitar speaker? And I will say that when people talk about speakers having a sound, eight, 10, 12, 15, 18, they don't have a sound that's characteristic to the diameter of that speaker. However, uh, if they do have colorations that relate to the diameter of that speaker, you sort of get tied to them in strange ways. So if you're trying to make a really accurate speaker that has minimal coloration, minimal distortion, flat frequency response, broad dispersion, all that, and you get that design really right. You can then scale that up, scale that down. You just have to change other parameters and make it work. An eight isn't going to sound like an eight just because it's an eight. So you can have an eight inch subwoofer, you can have an eight inch mid-range speaker. They sound completely and utterly different. You can have an eight inch guitar speaker, that sounds different. That eight inch guitar speaker is gonna sound more like a 12 inch guitar speaker than it's going to sound like an eight inch subwoofer or an eight inch mid-range speaker and so on and so forth. But in the world of guitar, 12 inch guitar speakers are really inaccurate, really imprecise, full of coloration, full of tone, um, because the tone of electric guitar isn't the tone of an electric guitar, it's the tone of an electric guitar through an amp, through some speakers heard in a room by some people. You know, it's an electric guitar on its own, doesn't make any sound, it's gotta go through an amp. And then when the amp goes through the speakers, the speakers don't show you exactly what the sound the amp is putting out, they do their own thing to it. So it's, it's, it's all sort of stacked on top of each other. So that meant if you were going to scale this up and down, you've got this problem where you've got two speakers and you're reliant on two speakers for the system to work. So then if you're going to make it work to get a 12 inchy guitar sort of sound, you're gonna need a two by 12. And actually two 12 inch speakers is, they can generate a lot of output, you don't, always need that much output, especially in the modern world where we have more PA systems and in-ears and things like that. Um, so I found myself thinking about this idea of this bit having a port and this bit, hello again, having this device with this diffraction slot and this sort of waveguide type thing. And 
I started pondering, well, what would happen? Is that a, is that a feather floating around me? I should just say that this, uh, I'm not in my bare face hoodie right now because I haven't got around to finding it. Also, I'm quite frugal or stingy depending on how you look at it and this is our sort of studio space here so I'm not in the main factory. The main factory is probably a bit warmer, the office is a little bit warmer than that but my general approach to um, running a business is oh, don't waste money on things you don't need to waste money on. So um, we keep ourselves busy, we make sure we don't freeze, we turn on the heating if, if we have to in the office um, and we wear more clothes. So I am wearing, I believe, I bought this in America in 2002 when we were on a holiday, um, but it has got some holes, so bits of down occasionally um, come out of it. And I think the fleece is a few years younger than that, but not much in it. Um, so yay for keeping clothes going. I have the same attitude towards musical equipment. It should last. Um, you know, it should we, we should. we should not make disposable things. We should make quality things which may cost more but it doesn't matter in the long run because the true cost is much lower because you get them for longer and the true cost to the planet is lower because you're not building stuff and throwing it in the bin and wasting things. So I'll get off my soapbox. I wasn't actually on a soapbox, that was a metaphorical one. And get back to the subject of can you make this AVD slot here work as a Helmholtz resonator, which is what a, a port is named after Mr. Helmholtz, I guess. Um, another classic Helmholtz resonator, which I just remembered about, is the old um, blowing across the lid of a bottle, blowing across the neck. I think that's a Helmholtz resonator. You do get this weird thing with things like pipes and thing containers with holes in them and pipes that sometimes a container with a hole in it, um, when you blow across it, the air in the hole the air mass there bounces on the air spring of the enclosure, the container, and that gives you a Helmholtz resonance. But sometimes if it's more like a pipe, it's then more like, say, a flute or an organ pipe, where instead of it being a mass on a spring, air mass on air spring, for, uh, natural resonant frequency, it becomes a standing wave using the length of the pipe, um, like a wind instrument. So um, anyway, I digress. So I was thinking, can we make this work? So eventually, I got round to doing something about it and we knocked together a very, this one's a bit heavy, it's got a speaker in and something loose kicking around it. Quick prototype, which used one of our 110 cabs with a hole cut in the back and two panels put in like that. And um, it did work, it didn't work quite right. We realized it needed some bracing or something and yeah it didn't sound quite right but it did put sound out in a fairly cool way. I think it was looking at that, looking at the size of the slot and the enclosure and stuff, I think it was probably tuned too high. Um, just to go into tuning frequency because that's something that people like me just go oh yeah tuning frequency or whatever for the box for a port. Um, like it's some sort of, well either an incidental thing or some sort of magic thing that everyone should know or that it's a concrete set in stone sort of thing. It's not like that. Some people will tell you that if you want a ported loudspeaker to produce sound then your tuning frequency needs to be set to the lowest frequency you want this speaker to produce. That has to be your cutoff frequency. So you will come across um, say even uh, some bass cabs where they tune it to the low B of a bass guitar because 31 Hertz is the lowest frequency, well the lowest harmonic frequency that a five string bass can put out and the logic being that therefore everything must be tuned higher than that. Uh, sorry, every, every bit of sound must be higher than that tuning frequency because below the tuning frequency the speaker unloads, which as we did in that other video is where you go from the port and speaker to going port and speaker from 0 degrees out of phase to 180 degrees out of phase. But actually it's it's not really like that. You can tune higher than that um, because the port keeps doing stuff below the tuning frequency, just doesn't go that far below. And also 
speak um, instruments as they get down towards their fundament, their lowest fundamental. So, open E string on a standard tune bass, or open B string on a five string bass, or open E on a standard tune guitar, or open B on a seven string guitar, or is it B, E an octave down on a baritone guitar? Or is that just a Fender bass six? Anyway, the thing about all these low frequencies from basses or guitars or whatever is that the lowest notes from a bass are coming from a string that isn't really as long as it should be. A double bass is a lot bigger than a bass guitar, but again, its strings aren't really long enough to support those low notes for a long time, that, that's particularly the fundamentals for a long time. So also the amps we're using, they tend to roll off lower down. There's really a lot of stuff going on. It's important to understand that we are playing music with these instruments. They are not sound generators in some sort of scientific sense. They are, they're not sound weapons, they feel like it when they're in your arms, but um, they are producing tone in a musical way and therefore it's really important not to get too hung up on the, you know, what's going on in that sub 100 hertz area. It needs to sound right, it needs to feel right, but, and that will come down to all sorts of things that are going on in terms of the response curve and the transient response and, and things like that, and how, and the dynamic response, what happens when you really crank it and how the uh, response curve changes and how the dynamic response and transient response changes as you crank it. But it's important not to get too obsessive over that in a scientific way, because if you do get too obsessive over a tuning frequency or frequency response in a scientific way, you almost always show that you are looking in too narrow a way at what's going on in those low frequencies, because there is more to it than a, fre a low frequency minus 3 dB limit number or a minus 6 dB limit number or a random number that says frequency response or anything like that. And likewise, tuning frequency, you can't say because this cab is tuned to 30 hertz, it can't produce any sound at 28 hertz. It doesn't work like that at all. You know, it, these are roll-off frequencies, tuning frequencies. They are not set in stone in a simple way. I mean, in many ways, they are set in stone in, well, they're not even, do you know, they're not even entirely set in stone. If you get a slot-ported cab and you put it on the ground, the tune, right, you know, hard on a hard floor or even next to a carpet, but so that slot port is running next to the ground, slot port being one of those letter boxy ones, put the slot port on the ground, that tuning frequency is gonna be slightly lower than if you turn the cab upside down and have the slot port at the top because the bit of floor next to it extends the perceived length of the port. So there is a lot of stuff going on. I seem to have sort of gone off on some tangents. So I only got as far as showing you the first of the prototype single driver guitar camps. But I think that is probably a good place to pause for now. Chuck out some questions to you about what you want to know more about and what you don't understand and what I should witter more about and what I should witter less about. Ask you if turning up the light has helped. All this technology. I'm not very interested in fiddling with all these techie things. Ironic considering I'm an engineer who likes... I don't know if I like fiddling with things. Oh, I don't really know. I know what I like and I know what I don't like and I do not like fiddling around with computers. I will tell you that I am bored of that nowadays. I just want things to do what I want them to do, which is why I enjoy playing bass through things with knobs and I don't want menus on anything to do with music, if I can help it. Oh, unless it's lunch. Anyway, on that subject, I need to go and deal with a shop that's about to arrive at my house. So thank you. Goodbye, I've been Alex from Barefaced, and we do cool things. If you haven't heard of us before, Google Barefaced guitar camps, Google Barefaced bass camps, and you will find out that we make, I would say, the best of these in the world. Thank you, bye.